Hello and welcome to Inside the Women of Denver, where we talk to local leaders about their successes, failures, and lessons learned on the journey to success. I'm Crystal Covington, and today I'm talking with Carly Ransom, a financial professional with a true passion for helping others succeed. She's a community leader and an educator and a tremendous advocate for Denver women. Carly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad to have you. <laughs> All right, so let's start with an introduction. Tell us a little bit about you and how you came to your current um, career. Yes, well, my current career is I have a financial advising business. I'm an investment advisor representative. My story of how I got there actually started with my career in teaching. Uh, I was a science teacher for many years at the high school and college level, most recently doing chemistry and college biology. It was super fun. Um, when I went into teaching, I, I wasn't concerned about the money. I just loved science and data, and I was a geek. I still am a geek. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always geeked up. <laughs> yes, so I still am. I wish I could have moved on, but I haven't. Um, and I just, I loved teaching and helping my students. Um, but then all of a sudden I realized, wait, I have these expensive hobbies. Um, I like traveling to go surfing, and I like eating sushi, and yes. I like <laughs> snowboarding. And um, also, the kind of guy that I was attracted to wasn't going to support that either. <laughs> uh, you know, the homeless surfers weren't really going to support my surf trips, or the musicians with substance abuse problems, they weren't really going to help either. Oh so my gosh. I thought, OK, I love teaching, but I need some more income. So what I did is I got educated about investing. And in my first investment workshop that I went to, I learned about compounding interest. And I oh. thought, wow, how have I never known about compounding it's interest? It's so exciting yeah. when you learn about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like, this is great. My money can just grow. It's not guaranteed, but, but it can yes. grow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyways, I got into it. And I, so I've been investing for the last 12 years. Okay. And it has really helped me out during tough times. Yeah. So for example, um, just recently, during my unpaid maternity leave, um, my investment income helped support me through that so I could have just a little bit of a longer maternity leave. So wow. I am happy that I got into it. And now um, I, what I've noticed over time is that more and more I've noticed that not everyone gets into it. Not everyone wow. wants to spend time looking at data <laughs> like no. a geek like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and really, you know, our country doesn't do a great job preparing everyone. We don't learn about finance in high school. Um, we don't learn about it in college a lot of times. And so I feel like we just need to have more investment advisors out there. Yeah, it's uh, so important. So I just wanted to basically become the investment advisor that I would want to have. Oh. So I want to focus on really educating people and making sure that they truly, truly understand the data, truly mm -hmm. understand their investments, and that they have time to do the things that they need to do, like whether it's teaching people or helping their patients in hospitals or making science discoveries, that people can focus on that and then I can make sure that they're happy and secure. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the first things we did when my husband and I, when we first moved to Denver, was sit down with someone and start asking questions about money. And we had just recently learned about compounding interest <laughs> and I think it, they call it like the rule of 72 oh, yeah. or something like that and we were like, what? Yeah, our awesome. minds were totally blown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's how this stuff works. Yeah, you know? and it's not even, you know, the there's all the sciency parts of it, the financial analysts and all that kind of stuff. But just understanding that you can do something that is passive, sort of, and just kind of grow things, mm -hmm. versus having to always work to make more of it is really awesome. Yeah, and uh, one area that I focus on is that anyone can start investing. So I have, uh, I've had workshops like how to invest on a teacher's salary to emphasize the fact that you can be a first-year teacher and you can still invest. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be rich. Mm -hmm. uh, you just got to start. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> nice. So tell us a little bit. You talked about the career progression. So was there any other you know, pivotal moments or learning lessons that really helped you figure out the direction, because there's, you know, you could have gone a lot of different ways. You you learned about the financial world, but kind of uh, what drew you to decide that you wanted to niche yourself this way? Um, I think it started really when I saw many of my teaching friends um, lose some of their investments in 2008, 2009, and that they weren't prepared for retirement, and that they'd worked so hard in their life and then they weren't prepared. And I, I remember thinking, oh, 
why didn't their financial advisor help them or why weren't they ready? And I remember thinking, I could do a better job and I want to do a better job. And then over time, I just realized, yes, it's time. I need to do yeah. it. I need to help others. And I found myself just naturally wanting to help people yeah. with their finances. And also, I try to make it fun. Um, I think a lot of people don't connect with advisors at first because they just talk too much data and they don't make it fun. So I try to make it just a little fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It was a big step for you. Um, what are some of the greatest lessons that you've learned as you're talking to people and you're learning about, you know, other people's lives and exploring other, other um, learning about people? I mean, financial, uh, talking to people about their finances, you learn a lot about who they are as people. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the biggest things that you've learned while talking with some of your clients? Yeah, well, one thing I've learned is just the amount of emotion around money and many of my clients start crying. Oh. And so I've, it's just because there's so much tied to it. So even though people are much more than just their money, there's so much emotion tied to it. So I've learned that it's, wow, that's a big deal. and we need to take it seriously and uh, I've learned, I've tried to learn how to be a little bit of a counselor <laughs> as long, um, as well as an investment advisor. Um, and then over time, a lot, you know, a lot of my clients are business owners and mostly I've actually just been really inspired by my clients because they're starting all these amazing businesses yeah. and to learn about their journey and all the steps that they've made to start their business. I've been so inspired about all the things that they've done all over the world and what they've been through. The same here. I can, I can absolutely relate to that because doing this, this exact thing and, and working with my Women of Denver community, it's been inspiring learning about all the different things that people can do. Yeah. I'm like, really? People <laughs> do that and they get paid for it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's just a fun exploration of kind of like, kind of learning about what other people's stories are and what drew them to that point and then finding out the possibilities in the world. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another part of the story about that was uh, you, you asked about things that were transformational. Yes. Um, speaking of the world, when I lived in Japan for a year, that was a huge transformation because I grew up in a smaller town. It was actually a fishing village called Gig Harbor. Uh, a fishing village kind of turned suburb, actually. <laughs> uh, but still, it was a pretty small town. And then I went to school in also a pretty small town. Mm -hmm. um, and to go to Japan and learn not only about the Japanese culture, but about all the other cultures that were there teaching English in Japan. So uh -huh. the Brits and the Canadians and even people from the South. I didn't have a lot of friends from the South um, of the United States. Um, you know, the, the South Africans and the Kiwis and the Jamaicans. It was so fun to meet about, meet all those cultures from all over the world. And yeah. it opened my eyes that even though Japan was another first world country, that there's a whole different way of thinking. So it was just fun to get out. And now I feel like I'm always searching and looking for more opportunities and I can more easily see things from other people's perspective. That's so oh. important. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you've had a really amazing life. I mean, this is, I mean, just knowing that you've been in Japan, that you've had this experience of, you know, being a teacher and then moving to different types of careers. You've had a lot of exploration. You surf, you've skied. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, you're just so cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I went to a, cool a I know, you're yeah. a total <laughs> surfer geek. I mean, yeah. does that even combine? <laughs> <laughs> Traveler surfer geek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, some of the people in the audience were here, were with me at this, but I was recently at um, a conference with Tony Robbins, oh. and they kept saying to, for us to say, I love my life. And they gave us these oh. t-shirts that say, I love my life all over it. So I want to know, what do you love about your life? Oh, well, I actually really love my life now. So thank you for asking. Um, I feel very lucky and fortunate to say that. I don't think I've always said that throughout my life, but right now I have a lot of gratitude for my life. Uh, first of all, I love my family. I have a 10 month old and a three year old and a wonderful husband and wonderful parents and brother and all that. And I just feel really thankful that I have a good supportive family. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the main thing I like about my life uh, which relates to my family is that I've always been able to set goals and then go achieve them. 
And I'm just really thankful that I've been in a position to do that, that my parents raised me to be able to believe that I can go after my goals. And you know, when I was young, I had very immature goals. Like in high school, I wanted to be one of the first female pole vaulters in my <laughs> school. <laughs> By the, actually, that goal didn't work out that well. I was a horrible pole vaulter. I don't think I ever even cleared the bar. Oh. Um, but it was fun trying. Um, and then in my early 20s, I wanted to follow the whales and learn to surf. You know. Uh, which I did. I went to the San Juan Islands and Oregon and Hawaii and uh, very immature but fun. Um, and then later in my 20s I wanted to be the best science teacher possible and I wanted to really affect change in the world and so every day I would go and make sure that my lesson was interesting and unique and I wanted to draw my students in. Um, so I, I tried to do that every day. It's hard to do that every day but uh, and so I focused on that and then at one point, I think when I, about when I hit 30, like maybe many women, <laughs> I decided, oh, maybe I do want kids. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I um, decided maybe I should find a husband. And so <laughs> I, <laughs> I actually, I ditched those homeless surfers and the musicians with the substance abuse problems. They were out of there. And I actually went on eHarmony. There is a relationship coach here. Uh, I went on eHarmony and I was like, you know, I'm looking for a husband who wants kids. So if you don't want kids, you know, don't bother. And sure enough, I found a kind-hearted man who wanted kids and we, we have beautiful kids. So um, oh, wow. that was the goal. And then finally, now my, I've always wanted to start a business. And it just took me a while to get to that point where I was ready to start a business and um, so I started it and so far it's successful and I'm just like I said I'm just happy that I've been able to reach those goals and that I have had the, really that I've had the support to do it yes. and and you know people like you um, your community <laughs> is awesome this woman of Denver uh, you know I didn't have to go back to school to get an MBA because I've learned so much from your talks or the people that speak in your group Wow. Or the Rising Tides group as well. Yeah, Same thing. the there's, ones what you lead. Yeah, there's such, um, there's so much knowledge here in Denver, especially yes. the women and the entrepreneurial spirit here in Denver. Uh, I just felt so inspired by all the women here to, to reach these goals. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Oh. <laughs> 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 so I want to get another lesson. Um, you recently, and I'm on your mailing list, so <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of following. So you kind of put yourself out there and, and, and gave a, a boundary. You said you have, you, you said that, you know, you want to establish boundaries with your time and some things that you want to, um, you know, you want to do things a certain way. And I know that a lot of the women that I encounter have a really hard time with establishing boundaries, knowing what those boundaries should be and being comfortable with telling people mm -hmm. about those boundaries. So I want you to share a little bit about the bravery of being able to share those boundaries and how did you even come to the point where you said, you know what, I know how much time I wanna put into this or that and this is kind of you know, how I wanna manage my life. How did you get to that point? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think at first I didn't understand the boundaries um, and then I realized that when I would be out late at night and I didn't get to tuck my boys in, um, you know, like I said, I have a 10 month old, yeah. so he's a little baby, he's still very needy. And when I didn't get to go home to him, that I would just feel guilty, I'd feel sad, sometimes I would start crying. Mm -hmm. And I realized like these events are not worth it. Like, yes, mm -hmm. I wanna grow my business, yes. but it's not worth it to be crying on the way home because I feel so much guilt. Oh. Um, and the event that I involved you in <laughs> initially, I had planned a whole retreat uh -huh. um, with the help of some friends like Lori <laughs> and Crystal and I involved them and I, I even made flyers. We got that far and I realized I cannot go away for a whole weekend, even though yeah. I love these girls <laughs> that we're gonna do it with and I'm sure it would have been an amazing retreat, uh -huh. but I just couldn't go away for a weekend. So I canceled it, um, I was embarrassed. You know, I involved quite a few people and then I had to cancel. And so I guess, how, how do I do it? And part of it is sometimes I'm embarrassed, but I do it anyways. Yeah. Um, I have to apologize. I have to say, sorry, I'm canceling this. Or I have to apologize, like, no, I'm not coming to your event at night. Yeah, um, and just being okay with saying yeah. no. I mean, and saying no and, mm -hmm. and sticking to no. Yes, <laughs> that was a big deal for me because I looked at it and I said, this woman is making an example 
for all the people that feel like if I say something, I'm, I'm obligated. If I, you know, decide that I'm going to, I tell everybody I'm going to do this, I'm obligated. And I think women sometimes find themselves in a trap of these obligations because mm -hmm. we want to please everybody or we don't want to disappoint anyone. And I feel like that was a showing, a demonstration of strength oh, and <laughs> a, a beautiful example of, you know, what we all should be. And, and that's taking care of ourselves and our own personal needs and understanding who we are and what we really want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Thank that you. was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are there any other lessons you want to leave everybody with before we go? Well, my favorite quote uh, is from Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a mytho the mythologist and he says, um, follow your bliss. The universe will open doors where there were only walls. Ah. And the reason I like that quote is because many times, you know, we know we're supposed to follow our bliss. And we know we're supposed to attract things from the universe. But I think the key part is that, you know, you can attract things and you don't have to know how you're going to attract them <laughs> because the universe can open doors for you. And I really see a lot of truth in that and knowing that you don't have to know all the steps, mm -hmm. but just go for it and it can happen. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for everything you shared Thank and you. for all the authenticity. I feel like you were really authentic and you made us laugh <laughs> so much. Good. Surfer Geek Adventure in Japan. Yes, <laughs> that's me. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Thank you for spending mm -hmm. time with me, mm -hmm. Crystal Covington, and my guest, Carly Ransom. I really appreciate you spending time with us and I want you to always remember that you deserve to be seen, heard, and known. Mm -hmm. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.